Um, my name is uh, Dr. Matthew Lilly, and I'm going to be speaking about knee pain and going through uh, quite a few of the common diagnoses, a little bit of anatomy, and then uh, what's most fun uh, going through your questions and uh, make sure this is informative and enjoyable. And uh, we will get started with the PowerPoint here. So share this with you. And we will get we'll get going. Okay, so we'll be talking about navigating knee pain this evening. I am a, a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon specializing in surgery of the knee and shoulder. So uh, what we're talking about is uh, near and dear to my heart, and I spend almost half, if not more, of my day talking about this routinely. Um, so we're going to go through the common uh, diagnoses that affect uh, the anatomy um, of the knee, and uh, we'll do a little bit of um, uh, talking about the basic structures of the knee, not to bore you, but uh, just to give this uh, talk relevance, and going through patellofemoral pain, bursitis, which you may hear a lot about. Uh, it's not common in the shoulder. It's also common in the knee. A meniscus tear. Uh, ligament tears, uh, which are often common with uh, a lot of the sports that we participate here in Central Oregon, and then uh, knee arthritis, which is a very common diagnosis and uh, generally affects all of us at some point in our life. Um, and then we'll talk about both non-surgical treatment and uh, surgical treatment options. So going through a bit of basic anatomy, um, to keep it relatively brief, uh, what we're going to focus on is uh, mainly the four ligaments of the knee, which uh, are uh, very important in giving the knee stability with not only flexion and extension of the knee, but also with rotation. Uh, a lot of people think of the knee as just a hinge, but it actually rotates quite a bit and it allows us to uh, have significant stability while squatting, while climbing up ladders, etc. Um, then you can see on the end of the bones, femur and the tibia, there is uh, something called cartilage, which many of us are familiar with. Uh, I liken it to what we see on the ends of uh, chicken bones. Um, it's that smooth, uh, somewhat soft, and uh, very uh, frictionless surface that allows uh, the knees to the bones, the two bones, the femur and the tibia, to glide past each other. Um, also important is that kneecap, which floats uh, in two tendons, the quadriceps tendon above the kneecap and the patellar tendon below the kneecap allows that kneecap to glide along the front of the femur. And uh, that gives us power when we're climbing uh, and, and descending, especially getting up from a chair, et cetera. Um, then you have these two meniscus pads. Uh, they are basically firm cartilage discs and they help give us stability. And uh, it basically acts as a gasket that kind of cups the femur on the tibia and keeps that femur from sliding away. Um, and then last but not least, we have that fibula bone, uh, which acts as uh, kind of a strut on the side of the knee, um, not a significant weight-bearing bone, but uh, it allows for attachment of ligaments and tendons around the knee. Um, so this gives a little bit better view of the main bony anatomy of the knee, and uh, then looking at uh, basically the overall joint space and uh, where the cartilage lives, uh, you can see kind of in this blue region. And cartilage is a uh, pretty much a frictionless surface. Uh, it's five times less friction than ice sliding on ice. It gets its nutrition from knee fluid, and that's part of the problem. It doesn't actually get nutrition from blood like the uh, remainder of our tissues in the body. Um, it's mostly water, which is important. Um, it gives a lot of um, support, and it gives a lot of cushion this way. And it covers the ends of the femur, tibia, and the kneecap, the patella. Then we have that meniscus. This is a little bit better view of the meniscus. Uh, you can see up in the left, there's a cross section of it. And what's important about it is really only the outside. You can see kind of over on the left is the outside of the meniscus as it goes dives into the knee. Um, and it's this is basically the cross section. So it's just a cut through one of those semicircles. And you can see only the outside has blood vessels. And that'll be relevant with something we talk a little bit later about 
uh, meniscus tears. And the issue with tears is many of them happen in an area more towards the center of the knee where there isn't much blood flow and the meniscus can't heal very well because of this. But you can see looking down kind of on this top down view, just looking as you cut from the, the sky down on the tibia. And you see that the, over on the right is your medial meniscus or inside meniscus. And over on the left is your outside meniscus. And these two structures help kind of cup the femur. You can kind of see that they're those, those gaskets that uh, kind of fill in the extra space between the femur and the tibia and give kind of a bumper so that the femur doesn't slide out. Of course, the ligaments provide that support, but um, that extra constraint keeps our knee stable when we're pivoting and we're playing football or, or rugby, and, uh, and that's what makes these important. Um, ligaments, very important. It won't be the, the majority of our talk, but uh, just to give uh, kind of uh, continuity to the whole talk, uh, we have four main uh, ligaments uh, that provide the significant amount of stability to the knee. We have our ACL and PCL, which are two cruciate ligaments. Those are the two ligaments there in the center of the knee. You see it down at the bottom left. ACL being the one in the front, the PCL being the one in the back. The ACL gets a lot of attention as it gets injured often, uh, especially in sports, soccer, volleyball, skiing, uh, obviously football. And the problem with that ACL is it doesn't heal well. Uh, and the same, the same goes for the PCL. It's a much more robust ligament and doesn't get quite the impact uh, from our rotational uh, sports injuries, but can definitely be a, a problem with uh, instability. Um, then you have the two collateral ligaments. Those, uh, have the MCL and the LCL, MCL being on the inside of the knee, the LCL being on the outside of the knee, uh, those two provide a, a lot of stability as well. And oftentimes when they get injured, they can actually heal well, so we don't do surgery on them quite as much. Um, but uh, good to know just for uh, a, a full uh, picture of the knee here. And then uh, we'll look a little bit at, at tendons, uh, main tendons. We already talked about that quad and patellar tendon uh, encasing around the kneecap. We also have the IT band. That is a huge generator of pain uh, with overuse injuries, a lot of running, jumping, climbing uh, type activities. And that can have a lot of injury just kind of right there around the femur. You see the IT band just that goes pretty much down from the hip all the way down to the tibia on the side outside of the knee. So that's something we'll talk about. And then uh, the bursa, which is uh, important to talk about, which is basically a lubricated tissue that uh, runs in between tendons and uh, soft tissues that have to slide past each other. We know that bones uh, slide on bones in the joint with cartilage, uh, but tendons also have to slide past other tendons and bursas usually align these uh, structures along with uh, the underlying uh, soft tissues. Uh, so they can get inflamed with overuse type injuries, um, something we always have to consider when we're talking about knee pain. So what causes my knee pain? Um, this picture I really liked is uh, it's an uh, uh, endurance uh, race and going up and down hills, which is about the most stress you can put on your knee, um, sometimes eight to nine times your body weight uh, when uh, descending. Um, so this can put a lot of force on the knee causing uh, knee pain, and I, I see this routinely. Um, so patellofemoral pain is uh, the pretty much the most common cause of pain. It's certainly uh, around the knee. Uh, it is significant in running athletes. It's significant in uh, a lot of folks uh, doing uh, jumping or uh, repetitive uh, type uh, flexion extension exercises with their with their knee. Um, most common from muscle imbalance. And it's usually that kneecap that, as you saw in those earlier slides, that kneecap is relatively free floating. It's not encased by any major ligaments, it just has soft tissue attachments and, and two tendons. And so it can slide. And if you, know, if you relax and fully extend your knee, you can kind of feel your kneecap will move back and forth from side to side. And uh, it has a tendency to want to move towards the outside when it really likes to be more towards the inside. And when that imbalance is in place, the we're putting a lot of force through that kneecap, it causes a lot of strain on the inside soft tissues. Um, and it's often successfully treated with activity modification, anti-inflammatories, and uh, improving our overall mechanics with uh, a better muscle balance and physical therapy. Um, then tendonitis, uh, usually caused from 
uh, overuse uh, of the tendons, basically too much force going through those tendons. I liken it to uh, basically you're demanding from the tendons more than they want to give. And that, that depends. It's different for everybody. You know, uh, an NFL football player um, has gradually increased the force they've put through those tendons, and so they can demand a lot so compared to, to some other folks. Uh, and it just depends on activity. Now, if you, that NFL football player went into gymnastics, it might be a, a different story. Um, and looking over here, I, I like this picture because this gives kind of a little bit of a, on the bottom left, a picture of that IT band, the iliotibial band tendon. So on the outside of the knee, gives a picture of what it looks like when it has inflammation and uh, it looks kind of that rough beat up. It even has a little bit of fat kind of around it and it's kind of just chronic inflammation underneath. And so we actually, I mean, it is a living tissue and it it's, uh, can get chronic inflammation that can infiltrate it when it's just been overused, it's been running too many marathons and, or uh, climbing too many hills. Um, and then looking at bursitis, this is kind of a good picture of what bursitis looks like. So we have a big bursa over the front of our kneecap that allows that soft tissue of the skin to glide over the kneecap as we flex and extend our knee repetitively throughout the day. And it can get full of fluid from just chronic inflammation. Um, similar uh, bursa just right uh, in front of the tibia, kind of on the inside. That's where our hamstrings attach. I think people think our hamstrings all attach right in the back, but they actually uh, wrap around there on the inside and attach on the front of the tibia and allow us to... To, uh, to flex that knee. Uh, and those those uh, tissues of the bursa make, make fluid and they can become acutely inflamed and oftentimes uh, we have to treat those with uh, some of our uh, non-operative uh, treatment measures. And then so th this slide's great. This is uh, one of the most common uh, causes of knee pain uh, intrinsically deep within the knee. The, so meniscus tear. Like everybody's heard about meniscus tears. Uh, or if not, they have now. Um, and uh, basically, the meniscus uh, is that firm cartilage, and it, uh, it can get tears in pretty much two different ways. One is an acute injury, high-impact injury, that uh, puts too much pressure and it tears in the tissue. Um, second is kind of repetitive overuse. And it, it's uh, our meniscus pads get a little bit firmer with time. And as they become more firm, they become a little bit more brittle and a little bit less resistant to, to repetitive impact, and they can break down with time. And that's what this picture here on the right in the center looks like. That looks like a meniscus that's been uh, traumatized a little bit too many times. And once it breaks free, it can, it can move around the knee and be in places where it doesn't feel good, it can pull on the surrounding soft tissue, and uh, get a feeling of instability. That can be everything from... Uh, catching, locking, swelling, click, but the most common symptom, um, which is really non-specific, is this, what this whole talk is about, is pain. Um, so oftentimes, kind of, the, it's really a deep feeling in the knee, sometimes in the back, uh, right along the sides, and then gives those symptoms, uh, especially when people are uh, doing deep flexion and swelling, that's when we put the most pressure on so you can see there's various forms of, of tears, um, and it can affect the meniscus in many different ways. Um, but yeah, one of the most common uh, treatments for these is, is really non-operative. We, we see how uh, the symptoms resolve. Sometimes they're, these meniscus tears can go into some dormancy and inflammation dies down, and actually people's symptoms go away without any treatment. The one thing is they do not generally heal on their own. So uh, because of that blood flow, what talking about the, the tissue does not necessarily mend together. And so if it does become more of a repetitive uh, issue that uh, impacts people's activities, then uh, we talk about surgery and actually cleaning out that tissue. You can see kind of over here, um, a, good, a good example is that bottom middle tear. Usually you can just remove that hangnail with an arthroscopic surgery. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and that can just remove the damaged tissue. Um, now, now, the issue with this is in the setting of arthritis, and I'll get into that a little bit later, that uh, these meniscus tears often, often can exist in the setting where there's a significant wear and tear of the underlying cartilage. Now, if you look at that center uh, picture, you can see that the femoral cartilage and tibial cartilage are relatively intact, and it looks good. Um, so this would be a meniscus that could be treated well arthroscopically. But when, I'll look at a few uh, slides later, where arthritis exists, the meniscus tear isn't necessarily always the main pain generator. We have to consider that. And then ligament tears, uh, 
we've talked about those just a little bit, but it often gives that feeling of a, a pop and stability, feeling like the knee gives out that they don't trust their knee. Um, and that's usually a pretty acute injury. And then cartilage injury, I wanted to give a slide showing what a uh, significant cartilage injury looks like. And this is one where there's basically a, a punch out of the cartilage. And often we can treat that um, because there's not really surrounding arthritis. And you, there could be loose fragments around the knee. We clean those out and often can uh, get scar cartilage to form or even, even new cartilage to form with some of the advances we have today. And then going into the main cause of uh, knee pain that we see and uh, uh, it can be uh, existing in, in a, a few different forms, but the one we most commonly know is it's osteoarthritis. And that's basic wear and tear. Uh, osteoarthritis is basically your body uh, being inflamed because there is uh, too little cartilage in a region of the knee, if not all regions of the knee. And because there's not that cushion, not that support and stability, uh, your, your knee and the bones and the soft tissues in the knee feel more friction and your body is trying to heal that and make it better. And it does that through general inflammation, swelling, pain, uh, which are molecules that circulate in the fluid of the knee. And as it can't heal the knee, it uh, doesn't go away. Um, so that's the main problem with arthritis. And it can often cause bruising of the bone and extra swelling of the bone. And a lot of folks uh, who have arthritis want, uh, do end up getting MRIs, and it can actually show that process. You actually see the swelling in the bone on an MRI because MRIs look at fluid uh, around the knee. And it can also show the, uh, the swelling. Um, one thing about arthritis is symptoms are, are tend to be somewhat waxing and waning. I know I talked about that the symptoms don't necessarily go away, but they usually uh, can go up and down, worsening with activities over times of year, um, and then sometimes better just uh, depending on, on how activities and uh, time changes. Um, this is a picture. Uh, some folks ask me about five arthritis. Uh, why, why do I need to get x-rays or why do we get x-rays when um, you know, I think it's something else, uh, soft tissue related. And x-rays do uh, give a good indication of whether it's significant wear and tear. You can see um, this uh, picture on the right, which um, is the arthritic knee. And there's, there's pretty significant loss of that space, that space between the femur and the tibia, you can see. And that is basically where the cartilage is, and it doesn't show up on x-ray. So when that cartilage is gone, that space is gone, and those bones get closer together. And you can see the bone spurs are forming, and some folks ask me, oh, can you take the bone spur out and make it better? And bone spurs are just really a reaction. It's your body trying to heal that arthritis by doing what it knows how to do, laying down new bone, kind of stiffening the joints, and, uh, and that's a product of the inflammation. So taking out the bone spur doesn't really help very long, and the problems just come right back. And I wanted to get this slide just to kind of give a picture of what it looks like when the knee is inflamed. Some folks uh, wonder why the knee hurts. There really is actually inflammation, increased blood flow, increased redness and swelling on the inner lining of, of the joint. And this can be caused by arthritis or even injuries. And I talk about some of the other arthritis uh, problems that folks can have, including gout, which can be um, crystals actually uh, that are floating in the knee and your body react, reacting to those. And then rheumatoid arthritis, which is our own immune system's attack from the knee. Um, but not quite as common as this uh, standard osteoarthritis. So um, this this slide was great because um, without getting into too much of the biochemistry of it, it, uh, it shows, number one, how that there are kind of over here on this uh, left image that there are basically pain generators um, that are made by the inner lining of the knee uh, to react to the arthritis. And it can break down the actual uh, cartilage as well just by chronic inflammation being there. And... Uh, one important factor is just maintaining a level of activity. Some folks think, oh, my knee's injured, it's swollen, it hurts, it's not good to use it. Um, but it's quite the opposite, uh, that actually that impact of pressure on the knee helps um, support uh, fluid in the cartilage and it helps support lubrication of the cartilage and actually decreases symptoms of arthritis. That's why the number one recommendation, um, although counterintuitive sometimes for osteoarthritis, is to be active. Uh, motion is lotion for the joints, as I like to say, even though it's uh, somewhat cheesy. Um, obviously, fractures something we have to consider when folks uh, have falls, especially these days on when there's so much ice outside. Um, but uh, anytime there's a, a, a direct impact to the leg or knee, uh, have to. That's why it's important to get X-rays and have to take a look. 
And uh, just to gives a picture of some of the options when there are, is a, a deep injury to the knee. Uh, they sometimes involve lots of plates and screws, which uh, help the bone then back together and, and uh, get folks back walking again. So <clears throat> this is an important slide, uh, one I always like talking about in relation to knee pain. And uh, basically it was the, uh, one of my mentors when I was training in uh, San Francisco. And uh, he actually had a friend of uh, his uh, spoke his knee while he was awake and uh, got a lot of attention uh, naturally. And he wanted to map out parts of the knee while uh, his uh, fr uh, friend was uh, doing an actual arthroscopy and actual surgery on him. Um, minimal invasive, but still inside his knee and checking different parts of the knee to see which hurt the most. And he mapped it out and he stayed, uh, stayed alert for it. He just used a little local anesthetic for the incisions and that was it. Um, so as you can see here, kind of the, the severe pain regions are really that, that lining of the knee, kind of where it's black and dark uh, right in the front. There's a fat pad that we all have uh, just under the patellar tendon, and that is exclusively tender. And uh, he talks about uh, having a few yelps uh, while uh, that was being uh, evaluated. And then the ligaments in center knee, ACL, PCL, R, along with the whole inner lining of the knee. Um, one part, uh, which is interesting and it didn't hurt, was uh, right under the kneecap. So that thick cartilage right under the kneecap, you can see it's a big zero. And uh, that uh, really didn't have a lot of sensation. So uh, we always take a look at uh, kind of where the kneecap lies with the femur. And there's so much force uh, that goes through. When I was talking about running uphill, that's where that eight times your body weight goes through that, that, that interaction between the patella, the kneecap, and the femur. And uh, it's, it's our body is really uh, used to a lot of force there and, and uh, doesn't necessarily generate a lot of pain. So um, kind of an interesting interesting fact and where, where knee pain comes from in the knee. So um, what can we do about it? So, well, I have to, have to talk about the main first parts. A lot of us uh, know these and, and start. Uh, usually when folks come into my office, they've already tried rest, uh, changing their activities, then giving it some time, uh, ice, uh, decreasing inflammation. It's always good when there's a uh, swollen, painful joint to, to try a little ice. Um, compression can help, and then keeping it up elevated above the heart, along with non steroidal anti inflammatories. So uh, things like Aleve or ibuprofen, Motrin, um, and or some prescription strength medications can help. And then um, uh, seeing your doctor um, when it's not known what it is. Uh, it's uh, causing any disability or significant pain or just uh, just any question about it, uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to help and, and take a look and, um, and and go through all the possibilities. Um, and it's always good to, to do a physical exam. It's hard to determine what's going on with yourself and an and a objective observer can, who's trained in this uh, can definitely give you a lot of insight. Um, getting x-rays, very important. You can take a look and see anything... Uh, going on and everything from broken bones, loose bodies, uh, to that arthritis like we talked about. Uh, bracing, I talk about bracing. I'm not a big believer in it. Some folks are. Um, braces can do everything from just give you a sense of your knee, give you a little bit of uh, compression and kind of when you're out doing activities, brace makes you a reminder of that knee. Um, in the setting when there's actually a ligament injury, they can be helpful um, to provide stability, but in a, in a stable knee with uh, without a major ligament injury, um, it, they, they tend not to, to be quite as critical. So um, always open for discussion on that. And then anti-inflammatories. We talked about the non steroidals but um, a big anti-inflammatory we use here in clinic is, is uh, cortisone. It's known as cortisone, um, corticosteroid. Uh, it's a lot of bad press sometimes. Uh, the, the big question I get is, is cortisone bad for you? Um, and there's lots of ways of answering that question. Uh, basically, it's a big pain reliever. Um, it turns off inflammation in the joint. Uh, it has been shown to have a negative impact on cartilage over time. Uh, I usually say that a one-time injection is, is not necessarily detrimental to cartilage, um, but uh, especially in the setting when there's arthritis, there's already some breakdown of the cartilage, that the, uh, the benefit of improving uh, people's function and ability to use their joints uh, without pain is, is much outweighs uh, the downside risk of maybe not, not a lot of cartilage in there anyway. Um, but in the setting where there's another factor that can actually be treated successfully without cortisone and, and uh, there may be risk associated with that injection to the cartilage, uh, we definitely shy away from 
Um, physical therapy is important. I won't get into this and I'll talk about physical therapy, but uh, basically it can help with range of motion strengthening and balance and overall confidence in, in the knee, especially. Um, and as you have a stronger, more stable knee, uh, pain generally goes away. Uh, important injections that we do talk about are the lubricating injections. They sometimes get referred to as chicken foam injections or syn disc injections, uh, but basically they're hyaluronic acid, HA. And uh, this is a molecule in the joints, and what it does is it helps lubricate the cartilage and bring water into the cartilage, which uh, helps uh, give it more cushion and more support. And this is uh, great in the setting of mild or moderate arthritis. Uh, it can help give up to six months of relief and basically decrease the inflammation in the joints. Um, so I, I think it's a, a great adjunct or um, off, uh, offering in, in lieu of cortisone. And uh, a lot of patients respond very well to it. So something to consider and talk with your doctor about. And then getting an MRI, um, this is where it's, it's really up to kind of where uh, you think the knee pain is coming from. In, in the setting of maybe a meniscus tear or an acute injury, MRIs are great because they reveal a lot of information about the surrounding soft tissue. You can see kind of in this top image, that's, a, that's what a basic side view of the knee looks like. You see the kneecap at the front, the femur and tibia kind of in the center there, and then a meniscus pad um, is a little black triangle kind of in the back between the two bones. You can see actually a little white line going through, and that's a tear of the meniscus. And that's where soft, the soft tissue is well evaluated by an MRI when you can't see that on the x-ray. Um, so very helpful. But when we see that folks have maybe bone and bone arthritis, uh, we can see that the joint space is uh, lost and there's uh, bone spurs. MRI isn't necessarily helpful in those situations and um, uh, not, uh, not always necessary. So uh, always something to consider and talk with your doctor about. Um, I always uh, mention the importance of uh, taking calcium and, and vitamin D uh, when uh, women are over the age of uh, 50 and men 70 and older, um, just to uh, in increase bone health and improve uh, 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 overall strength of bone and decrease risk of uh, fracture. And then I'll talk about surgical treatment. So we talked a little bit about arthroscopy. I mentioned scope, um, something uh, I don't, don't, didn't know what a scope is, but a scope is a, a shorter slang for arthroscopy. Um, and that's, that's basically what this surgery is right here. Where you can go in with through, uh, several small incisions and take a look and have a, a full evaluation of the inner workings of the knee and treat uh, many, many of the conditions. Um, it's an outpatient surgery. People respond very well to it and uh, has a wide range of applications. Um, so we talked a little bit about meniscus treatments and I want to talk about repair. And the main reason we aren't able to always repair those meniscus pads is like we talked about that blood supply. Um, so when a tear is as far in the back and there's good blood supply, we can often repair it, put a stitch in it, allow it to heal. Folks have to, to keep weight off for a while until the two sides can bend together. Uh, but uh, like that slide earlier, I showed you with a lot of wear and tear and tear is going in many directions. Sometimes that tissue is not healthy anyway. It's better off to just take it out and uh, clean it out overall. And that decreases symptoms and people have a quicker recovery, don't have to keep weight off of it and can be doing quite well in anywhere from two to two to six weeks. Um, I, I included this study. Uh, there was a, a look a few years back now uh, at, and maybe folks even remember where they talked about doing uh, sham surgery. Uh, where they basically did an arthroscopy on some patients and uh, other patients, they basically uh, just did uh, made incisions and actually didn't do anything, didn't actually clean up any of the cartilage of the knee and other folks where they uh, uh, didn't really do anything at all. And they looked at other than conservative treatment and um, they looked at how folks responded at uh, different points in time over the course of two years. And in the setting of arthritis in these patients, uh, that had arthritis, that there was no real significant difference. Now, this was obviously just one study and uh, a different population, but uh, overall, they showed that going in there and cleaning up arthritis, so by the kind of scraping cartilage uh, uh, compared to uh, making incisions and uh, not really doing the treatment of the knee versus just going to sleep and having nothing done, really nobody had a significant uh, difference in their uh, overall outcome at any point in time. They, but though that being said, folks did get better with all of these treatments. So there is some effect of, of placebo and just uh, treating your knee. Um, but this, kind of, this is where uh, 
medicine and orthopedics has changed over the, the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, with we're, we're not necessarily treating arthritis with our arthroscopy surgery as much. And uh, this looks at a few of the options uh, with replacing cartilage. In the setting where there's widespread wear and tear, we really don't have a good option of uh, putting cartilage back. Folks ask me often about stem cells, and that every, includes everything from fat stem cells, uh, blood stem cells, and uh, putting that in your knee is uh, great. It can sometimes make you feel better, but it doesn't necessarily go into the bone and make cartilage. Um, so uh, we just aren't quite there yet with our technology. Uh, what we do have is we have transplant cartilage. We're able to grow small patches of it and, and fill in those little defects like one of those earlier slides I showed, um, but not actually um, put widespread cartilage back in the knee or, or even really any other cushions, uh, so to speak. There's nothing that's as robust and durable as, as cartilage. Um, ligament re reconstruction, I talked a little bit about ACL being the most common. Um, this helps um, give support to the knee and decreases uh, overall stress on the soft tissue, so important uh, in our work. And then talking about surgery for arthritis, uh, everybody uh, probably has somebody they know that has a knee replacement these days. Uh, they, they are uh, just very, very common. Um, and basically, we'll talk about what it is. So a knee replacement. Um, can be partial or total. Totals are most common. Uh, and basically, it's replacing the ends of the bones of the knee, uh, femur, tibia, and patella, uh, with a, a, a new surface. And it's a resurfacing. So we cut the ends of the femur bone, ends of the tibia bone. Uh, and they're usually small small cuts, not not big cuts. Some folks uh, I think, oh, it's a whole knee replacement. You're taking out the whole knee and putting a whole new knee in. And it's, it's not quite like that. It's really just a resurfacing of the end. So I uh, keep your ligaments intact and uh, basically put a, a polymer of, of, of near frictionless surface uh, in between uh, two metal plates. And then there's a little, usually when the kneecap gets resurfaced, a little plastic button that goes on the back of the kneecap that can glide with the femur. And that helps um, allow the knee to move uh, without the two bones rubbing on each other. And the longevity of it is fantastic. It's increasing from what was thought to be 15 years, uh, maybe 20 years ago, to uh, much, much longer, 30 years or longer. So that gets us to the end of the talk and uh, kind of just wanted to open it up for questions. Um, hopefully kind of through that talk, we uh, were able to address some of some of the questions that came up earlier, but uh, yeah, feel free to use your Q&A and uh, I can uh, address some of of uh, what folks wanted to talk about. Okay, so um, some of the questions we have here. Uh, so some folks asked, uh, what are uh, the three best exercises to strengthen the knee and hips? Um, so uh, what I always tell, I mean, there's there's no three best exercises. Um, straight leg raises is one I, I routinely recommend. And that's basically working on extending uh, your knee out with ankle weights or not and uh, rotating your, your toes to either uh, point inward, straight up at the ceiling or outwards, and basically holding that leg up um, in, in sets of 10 to 20 or whatever uh, you tolerate. And that helps engage the quadricep and basically does a crunch for the knee and gives support. Um, then uh, I like wall sits. I like uh, core exercises and lunges. Uh, those, are, those are two others that I, I feel that really help stabilize both the hip uh, with engaging the core and in the quadricep and the knee. Um, then I have one question about uh, looking at doing two replacements at once. Um, I know some some joint surgeons out there do that. I don't myself. Um, it's a uh, knee replacement is a it's a big surgery. It's a big injury um, uh, for a short period of time. Uh, they work very well. They get people out of pain um, uh, by and large. But uh, the initial impact of uh, not having one knee that hasn't had surgery uh, is too much in my opinion, but uh, some folks folks uh, off that route. 
Uh, overall, I don't think the recovery time is that much faster. I just think it, it, it slows folks down to have had both at the same time. But uh, there probably is an indication in some scenarios. Um, now let's take a look here. Uh, so, uh, so one good question: What, what are some of the long-term effects of avoiding knee replacement? And um, and this kind of go tails into when is it, when is the time to do knee replacement? Um, really, the way I look at it is. The, the, really, the short answer is with, when that knee is impacting your daily activities to the point where you're not doing what you like to do and you're not playing with your kids or grandkids, you're not uh, being able to ski, you're not able to hike as much as you want. Um, and everybody has different activity levels, everybody has different goals, uh, but it's when it becomes an issue daily. And uh, all of the conservative measures, everything from injections, anti-inflammatories aren't doing the trick anymore. They're not just not giving that relief. And then it's time to, to consider knee replacement. Obviously, we take a look at x-rays, make sure that osteoarthritis is the main cause, and uh, we'll confirm that that's the source of the knee pain. Uh, but then uh, putting it off, there's nothing really dangerous. That's, the, that's one thing I, sh I wanted to mention is that it's, it, our osteoarthritis isn't necessarily dangerous. That outside of, yes, it can um, cause the knee to give out or cause uh, chances of falling, but uh, in and of itself, um, it's a it's a very slow progressive condition that uh, doesn't necessarily cause any long term downside. Although the pain can be quite exquisite, um, so there's no no urgency necessarily. Uh, but I I tell my patients that I, I don't really like folks trading good years for bad, and there's uh, no reason to be a hero hero and put it off as long as possible. Uh, that you can actually be out of pain and solve a problem and, and get back to a life you enjoy. Not have to not have to necessarily keep seeing me for it. Um, so that that's kind of how how I look at it, and, and obviously it's case by case, and everybody has a uh, different different goals and, and, and different needs. And one one thing I do tell folks about when they need a, a knee replacement um, is that they need to take care of it at a time when it's uh, not causing um, a lot of extra stress in life. When there's not a lot of family concerns, they have uh, good support at home, and uh, they can kind of focus on rehabbing that knee. Um, and one question, how long is the replacement surgery? So uh, I'll, I'll answer that and kind of recovery. Uh, we didn't talk about the, the, uh, uh, the recovery itself. Um, so the, the actual surgery itself quite quick. Um, anywhere, usually generally about two hours, um, uh, give or take. And uh, oftentimes uh, here locally, uh, we're doing a lot of surgeries uh, robotically. Um, so that means we basically take a, a CAT scan of your knee and can uh, uh, real-time live map out where the implants go and, and uh, place them exactly where they need to be to get good ligament balancing so the knee is stable throughout uh, uh, all phases of extension and flexion. Um, and uh, then recovery, uh, a lot of times the surgery is outpatient or, or a, a short stay overnight at the hospital. Uh, folks can walk on the knee right away. It's an immediately stable surgery. That's the nice thing. It's not like a, sometimes a, a meniscus repair or cartilage repair where we have to keep weight off it. We can actually um, have uh, folks walk on it right away and it's important. Um, it helps, uh, helps recovery, helps decrease the risk of blood clots um, and it helps get people moving well. So, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, the first week is usually the most difficult. Uh, it can uh, be a little bit swollen, a little bit sore. And then after the first week, pain generally trends down. Uh, but uh, it takes about two to three months for folks to get the range of motion back in their knee. And that's where physical therapy comes in. Physical therapy is usually a six to eight week course, maybe a little longer, um, depending. But uh, that is where we work on getting range of motion back. Uh, every knee replacement has a tendency to want to get stiff. That inflammation in the knee uh, causes scar tissue to build up, which is just normal. It's just our body's reaction to healing after an injury. And we have to battle that a little bit. It's kind of the no pain, no gain scenario. So uh, that's uh, uh, kind of the time frame. And generally, uh, folks are, are seeing kind of the full benefits of their knee replacement anywhere from three months six to six months and usually kind of reaches a steady state in about a year. Um, so 
I always kind of liken it to kind of a rapid uh, recovery and then kind of a slow, gradual recovery kind of as it levels off into, into kind of full improvement. And so I have a question about kind of intermittent knee pain um, that doesn't interfere, interfere with overall activities uh, and uh, to try and strengthen on your own or go to physical therapy. Uh, I, I think physical therapy is a, a fantastic way to start. Um, I, I don't think enough of us uh, take full advantage of it. Uh, it. It really can in initial phases when there's not an acute injury um, necessarily, and we just kind of want overall optimization. Physical therapy will teach us exercises we just don't do. They're just activities uh, and exercises that can improve the overall balance and kind of support of the muscles around our knee. Um, and I liken it to almost like brushing your teeth. Uh, it's basically routines that help your knee um, that you just have to kind of continue daily. And physical therapy can teach that to us. So uh, I think it's always worth a try. I think if nothing else, it gives you information and gives you um, um, data about your body that you learn with the, the, the therapist. And then um, another question, kind of going looking into the injections, is it effective? Is it effective to have steroid injection and uh, hyaluronic acid or uh, one of the things for antiflexive treatment? Um, yes, it is. Uh, it can be. The, the, a lot of doctors do it simultaneously, um, and it's kind of case by case. But steroid injection is obviously that big dose of anti-inflammatory and uh, turns off that inflammation in the knee. You saw kind of that red lining in one of the pictures um, and that cortisone helps uh, cool that down. And you flex is kind of more of that long-term support of the cartilage, helps bring water into the cartilage and can decrease kind of long-term inflammation by help supporting the inner structure uh, through, uh, yeah, that support and uh, can be more long-lasting. Cortisone, I usually say last three to four months. Obviously some folks have had years of success from a cortisone shot and others uh, have weeks. Um, so everything in between, but cortisone shot is pretty long lasting. Euflexa and the hyaluronic acid injections can be even longer sometimes. And then a question, yeah, do you, do you have to uh, do physical therapy after total joint surgery? Um, that, that definitely is uh, something I recommend. Not everybody does, I would say gosh, over 95% of my total joint patients do. Um, and the ones who don't um, tend to not quite get quite as much motion or, or get quite uh, as rapid return of their motion. So I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's definitely part of our routine protocol. And then uh, when when can you go up and down stairs after replacement? Uh, for me, it's the day of surgery. Um, if you have stairs and want to be tested on it, you can do it. It's slow. It's not fast. It's one step at a time and a break. Uh, but uh, you can do it slowly but surely, and usually with help of a walker, and that's where the therapist really comes in to help uh, uh, teach us that. And then another another good question is uh, uh, looking at how many of those cortisone injections do we do for knee pain, especially with the setting of arthritis or chronic meniscus tears. Um, it really is case by case uh, to kind of to just put a number and answer the question. Usually at the uh, three to four injection phase. Uh, it's when we start to often see diminishing returns on them. I uh, know everybody's different, but uh, you also one want to look at what are we really treating here? Is there something that maybe needs a little surgery, maybe needs a different uh, a treatment modality that can help? Um, you don't want to be just continually throwing cortisone at something that could get better in another way. Um, then, yes, usually cortisone doesn't last forever. It's not something that... Uh, really gets a full response. And so can we uh, look at, it, at another option, um, usually usually looking at surgery. So in that range, uh, I've, I've had folks who come in and they, they've done cortisone with their primary doctor for years and they come in and they say they help for two weeks. Um, and you're talking an injection that we can do maybe three times a year and you're getting two weeks of relief at each, each episode, really not the best use of time. But then other folks, you know, they do two injections a year and that's all they need to do, all the activities they want. And it usually just depends on the level of inflammation that they get from either arthritis or uh, degenerative joint disease, wear and tear of the, of the knee. And so, and one thing just to touch on, um, some of the uh, other, other kind of, uh, non-operative treatment modalities. We talked about physical therapy and the injections. 
Um, but uh, kind of to go back to it, low impact exercise really is critical. Um, I mentioned that as the number one treatment for often osteoarthritis, uh, even some of the overuse conditions. You want to keep your knee strong. And when I mention overuse conditions, that's those tendonitis pro problems and bursal problems. Uh, you still want to use your knee. It's not just uh, rest to do nothing. Um, it's usually just not putting a lot of stress, but cyclical motion. I often recommend walking, cycling, rowing, uh, swimming can be great, and uh, you know, even elliptical. So those are some of the go-tos. Uh, but even light weights can help. Uh, really just not carrying heavy loads, not doing high impact. Uh, I always use box jumps as a, an example of, of high impact, but that sort of thing. Going up and down the hills with heavy loads, that's all very hard on the knee. Um, not, not necessarily bad, uh, but just giving a higher tendency uh, for, for injury. Uh, then Looking at, I get asked, so is, is, is running bad for my knee? I'm, I'm an avid runner. I love running. Uh, I think it's, it's great for your cardiovascular fitness. Um, it's easy to do. And uh, there's really no evidence that running is bad for your knee in the setting when there's uh, no real uh, degeneration or, or injury to the name structures of the knee. Once we're dealing with uh, wear and tear of the cartilage, uh, running tends to, to have some downside uh, impact. Uh, so I tend to shy away from it and, and recommend some of those low impact treatment exercises when you're getting on an exercise bike or going for bike rides, walking, um, those sorts of things. So, um, and then I have a good question here with, uh, with the torn meniscus, what movements are not recommended? Um, trying to, everybody's trying to maintain their fitness, keep strong, keep strength. Um, I always say, don't really bend your knee past 90 degrees. So a right angle kind of right angle, nothing past this when bending your knee. It's that deep squatting in the knee that puts a lot of pressure on the back of the meniscus where a lot often the tears are. Um, twisting is recommended against. I would not uh, do a lot of twisting when there is a meniscus tear. Uh, that can definitely um, uh, impact the meniscus. Uh, folks ask me, oh, is it, is it making the tear worse or is it propagating the tear? Uh, not necessarily, uh, but it can just uh, re-aggravate the symptoms and bring up inflammation capsule. So uh, I usually recommend uh, against those sorts of things. Um, and and a, another good question here, uh, when part of the meniscus is removed due, due to a tear, uh, is there an increased risk of uh, further tears or damage uh, or, or increased risk of cartilage damage? Um, that's, that's a question I get often. So uh, you see those tears they're causing symptoms, they're catching, they're increasing inflammation in the joints. Uh, so you go ahead and take it out. Now, don't you have less cartilage in your knee? And the way I always like it to is, is that that meniscal tissue is flapping in the wind. It's not providing any support. So we take that out. Um, there's there's no less and no more cartilage than there was before the surgery as there is after the surgery. So uh, once that meniscus is out, uh, it's the same tissue that wasn't providing any support and really only causing uh, detriment. Now, is there a higher risk of a meniscus tear afterwards? And uh, the answer is generally yes. And it's not from that specific tear that we're treating. It's just that the meniscus is already prone uh, to these tears. So it's, it probably already has some intrinsic uh, uh, degeneration in the structure of the meniscal tissue. Uh, maybe it's, either, it's a little bit more brittle or hard, and it can be more prone to tears. Now, when we take the meniscus out, we're also removing more of the tissue, so there's less meniscus to actually tear later on. Um, so the actual remaining meniscus, yes, can get torn, but oftentimes we're removing enough of that tear that uh, the, the region that usually has a tear is, uh, is, is no longer there. It's not going to be torn, obviously. So um, I, it's, not, it's not too common once we've done a debridement to have a re-tear, uh, but you can have it in other parts of the knee. And a question about uh, why don't they do cortisone? injections for severe tendonitis. Um, actually, in my practice, I often do um, a, a shoulder severe rotator cuff tendonitis can respond well to a uh, cortisone injection. Um, IT band tendonitis, I, I, cortisone injections do great and often. Not only are they diagnostic, uh, when you put the injection in the region of tendonitis, it usually turns off uh, the inflammation at least temporarily, if not permanently. Uh, usually a little local anesthetic, it can turn off the pain generators for a while. It tells me if I put an injection there, it solves the pain, that's, that's where a problem is, um, but it also can decrease inflammation. So I think uh, cortisone injections are a great option for tendonitis. And then 
Uh, and another uh, question on what are the limits on uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatory non-steroidals? So two classes um, kind of that we think about in, in daily use. Non-steroidals um, uh, usually include ibuprofen, Aleve, Meloxicam, um, even Celebrex, which is a prescription strength, a little bit different um, uh, non-steroidal. Uh, but those have really two main things we're concerned with, especially in our, our practice for, for uh, healthy individuals. Um, they can be hard on the kidneys. Um, they get processed through the kidneys, not the liver. Um, but uh, they can also cause irritation to the stomach, so inner lining of the stomach. Um, uh, Celebrex has been shown to have a little bit less of that. Uh, but uh, yes, the, the, those are kind of the main concerns. So uh, I think that they are great for acute inflammation, a flare. I recommend them often three to five days um, uh, consistently, and they, they are very good at decreasing inflammation, not only pain if they're taken consistently um, as, as directed. Um, and then Tylenols can be also helpful. Uh, it acts on a little bit of a different mechanism. It's processed through the liver, uh, but it uh, is also to be used uh, uh, as directed as well sparingly. Uh, you definitely don't really want over three and a half grams a day of uh, Tylenol, so uh, I, I usually stir quite a bit less than that and with acute inflammation. Um, and generally, I, don't, I see people who have been on non steroidals for long periods of time, usually using as needed, uh, but certainly uh, not in the order of a, of a few weeks is, is, is enough in my book. Um, and then you have to look at other treatment options. Um, and then a, a quick question of uh, when you fix a meniscus, uh, uh, is the recovery time. Um, looking at uh, meniscus care, so when we do a clean out, like a debridement, uh, basically shaving the torn tissue and leaving the healthiest side in an arthroscopy, uh, that's a pretty quick recovery. Folks are walking on that knee right away, immediately day of surgery, and then can uh, work on getting back to exercises, usually after swelling dies down, and that's usually after about seven days or so, and uh, can get back to more normal activities anywhere from two to four weeks after surgery. Now, if there's a repair, uh, that's, that slows down the recovery quite a bit. And we're looking at a uh, period of not walking on it uh, because there's stitches that need to, to let that meniscus heal. Usually it's uh, anywhere from four to six weeks uh, using the brace and uh, crutches. And then there's usually a period of physical therapy for another six weeks. So I say generally that's a little bit more of a three to four month recovery. And um, just going into just a few more questions. Um, folks always ask, uh, should I use heater or, or ice? Uh, I didn't touch on that, but ice is, is very good for swelling, uh, acute pain, and uh, decreasing uh, acute inflammation. Um, now, heat is, is often helpful uh, kind of to loosen muscles, um, especially before exercise, um, or if there's cramping in the muscles, some people respond well to heat. It's not, not great to be using heat in the setting of swelling or inflammation or arthritis, um, but th that's kind of the, the framework I usually look at. Ice is generally best bet, um, and so uh, we routinely recommend that. And um, some uh, thoughts on the use of peptides for knee recovery. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, Yes, it's so it's uh, gaining a lot more traction. Um, there, the the concern with peptides, uh, number one, is they're they're somewhat off label. Uh, they're not really well regulated by the FDA, and they come from compounding pharmacies. So uh, the the consistency is not not just necessarily known to be there. Um, there's there's some elements that it's known to help modulate inflammation. Um, and uh, you're, you're always uh, concerned about, yeah, you would definitely wouldn't want to inject it in joints or anything like that in that way. But um, for things like partial tears of, of uh, tendons, uh, they could help modulate inflammation, but it's just not known. So it would be somewhat experimental. Um, so we don't routinely do that um, in our practice, but uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see as they, as they gain uh, uh, more widespread use, uh, whether they become uh, more common, then there's where there becomes more data available. Um, and then, um, yeah, some things to know about, about injections, whether um, they can cause swelling in the knee. And cortisone is generally well tolerated. 
uh, it's usually it's a poke in the side of the knee, sometimes in the front. Uh, there is always a little concern right after injection. It can cause a little bleeding, cause a little soreness, uh, and this can increase the uh, pain temporarily, but it usually should take effect within two to seven days. Um, if there isn't really a lot of effect by seven days, probably is, is not going to give much more than has already been experienced. Um, then kind of looking at those hyaluronic acid, those lubricating shots, uh, those have been known to cause a little bit of swelling in some of the older um, generation of the injections because there could be some protein that can irritate the knee. Uh, but overall, they're pretty well tolerated. And if you do get an inflammation, it's not dangerous. It's obviously uncomfortable. It needs to be treated, uh, but it's not dangerous like um, like an infection or anything like that. Um, and obviously, there's always a risk of an injection uh, causing an infection, but the risk is extremely, extremely low. Uh, yeah, so... Um, some things, you know, for folks who want to consider kind of just kind of global questions about uh, coming into the center, um, it's always good to to uh, do your homework, watching these videos, uh, looking at uh, kind of uh, overall options, and, and then discussing them with your with your doctor. Um, uh, it, usually, just uh, setting up a knee surgery as big and as permanent as a knee replacement is something that you want to have multiple conversations, talk with your family. Uh, find the support you're going to need. Uh, it does take a while. A uh, question I always get is, is how long is this going to take? You know, when I decide I need a knee replacement, it's time. Um, you know, it's anywhere from a month to to, to six, usually, when, when people are sticking to it. Uh, one main thing, we always need preoperative clearance. We need our, our patients' primary doctors to, to weigh in and say that you're safe and healthy for surgery. It's a big surgery. It's one we can choose to do, so we want it to be safe, of course. And... Uh, then it's about getting to the scheduling. It's making sure we have access to physical therapy. It's making sure we have support at home along with all the appropriate medications. And we talk about uh, medications after, after a knee replacement. Um, usually there's a short course of narcotic uh, pain relief, uh, which is used anywhere from uh, oh, three days to, to up to a few weeks. Um, Usually nighttime pain is, is the, the most common complaint you see after after a week or two. And that's just because people are becoming more active. They're, they still have some swelling. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, we're, we're changing um, kind of the inner uh, structure of the knee. There's irritation of the bone, quite a bit of inflammation. And uh, that, that takes a while for your body to adapt to. And anti-inflammatories are important, but narcotics do help. Um, and that nighttime pain is, is what is usually last to go. And it's usually because we're quite active. Uh, throughout the day, swelling increases by the end of the day. It's also time we have uh, the time to sit and think about the pain rather than uh, when we're up and doing things. So, um, yeah, that's that, that's kind of uh, what we're uh, addressing with, with knee replacements. And so it's just important to uh, know that there, there's a lot involved and there's definitely ups and downs with it. Uh, but by and large, people, people do fantastically with them. It's become a great surgery. Um, it solves what can be a chronic and debilitating of knee osteoarthritis and uh, and uh, gets people to be active and um, honestly uh, oftentimes not needing to see us again after after the surgery so um, definitely recommended and it's uh, if, uh, if knee arthritis is, is the main main cause of knee pain for you it's uh, should be should definitely be on the table not always uh, um, uh, you definitely not the first thing we talk about but uh, um, something that should be considered when, when arthritis is uh, just uh, becoming more and more of a concern. So that uh, ends the, the formal portion of our talk. And I, I appreciate everybody who uh, joined in and uh, were able to, to gain uh, some insights into their possible knee pain or knee pain that their friends are having. And uh, please feel free to uh, call us at the center, reach out to your, uh, your care team, and uh, uh, we're happy to have a, a further discussion. Um, yeah, thank you for joining this evening. Take care.